today's video is about my all-time favorite costumes from the film Crimson Peak. Crimson Peak was directed by Kira Montatoro and released in 2015. The gothic romance stars Mio Wazikowska, Jessica Chastain, and Tom Hiddleston. The first shot of the movie is actually at the end of the movie chronologically. It's Edith explaining that she knows that ghosts are real because she's seen them. Um, we then see younger Edith after, right after her mother has died and her mother visits her as a ghost and warns her of Crimson Peak. This is the beginning of a new century, right after Queen Victoria has died. Although the movie takes place partly in America, I'm going to be calling it Edwardian because I don't really know what else to call it. The costume designer for Crimson Peak is Kate Hawley, and she does an amazing job in my opinion. I'll mostly be talking about the costumes of Edith Cushing and Lucille Sharp because they're most interesting and I know more about women's clothing than men's even if it is Tom Hiddleston. Something I particularly enjoy about the costumes is the inspiration behind them. Holly looked through tons of paintings and real vintage items to create her costumes and it definitely shows. There are many paintings that I found that I know for sure that Holly took inspiration from and some that I found that I believe she took inspiration from, although I can't know for sure. There are also many real preserved vintage outfits that resemble these costumes. All of the details of the costumes, from the color to the silhouette to the time period, are well thought out and they all play a part in the movie, and I think that's one of the things that makes them so interesting, is that every single part of the costume is important. Ghosts are real. This much I know. Edith's outfits are actually my favorite. She has a very warm color palette with many yellows, creams, gold, and even some light greens. Holly compared her to a canary in a coal mine, a bird meant to warn of coming danger. Edith seems to be partial to Gigo sleeves of the 1890s, so we see her wear these often. They're also called Lake of Mutton sleeves. I'll probably call them that because I've seen the word pronounced so many ways I'm not quite sure what's the actual way to pronounce it. I love that Holly doesn't shy away from using the puffy sleeves of this time period. I think they're lovely, but I also think that most modern audiences probably don't have the same appreciation for them that I do, but I'm very glad that Holly decided to use them in the movie. Edith's sleeves are more than just for show, they also mimic the wings of a butterfly. Edith's sleeves change based on the mental state that she's in. When she's sad or scared, they seem to deflate, and when she is less freaked out by the ghosts in this movie, they do the opposite. When we first see Edith, she's a child and wearing a black morning dress, and then she's wearing her nightgown. Both of these dresses are very similar to outfits that Edith wears later in the film, which is a very cool resemblance, although I won't talk about these two costumes in very much detail. Next we see Edith wearing a gold walking suit. Holly named many of her dresses, and this one is called the Buffalo Bookworm. The dress consists of a black shirt and black tie, a double-breasted jacket with large buttons, a long skirt, a matching sailor hat, and very small skull pin on the tie that is barely noticeable, but it is a cool detail. Around this time, women's clothes occasionally reflected menswear, and in the scene where Edith attempts to pitch her book idea, that fact is evident. Contrasting against the other woman, Edith's dress is simpler, more sensible. The other women are wearing dresses covered with lace and feathers and all sorts of frills that make them seem cluttered and help Edith stand out. Although I do like the frilly dresses, they're some of my favorite from the time period, but, but it does help get the point across. This dress is also reminiscent of a particular cycling suit from the 1890s. Around the 1890s and early 1900s, sportswear became a bigger thing for women especially, and it's cool that we see a little bit of that in the film. She also wears this outfit when she visits her friend Alan a little bit later in the movie. Edith's hair is interesting because it is reminiscent of the Gibson girl style that was popular at the time, although not quite as big. This is one of the only ways that Edith wears her hair the whole movie. While Edith is talking with her father, she's wearing the same gold skirt but has changed her shirt for a white blouse with small red gold pleats and leg of month sleeves and floral embroidery. She wears this style of blouse often throughout the movie. When she works at her father's office, she again wears a similar blouse, this time with a tie. Again, we get to see Edith's feminine side along with the more masculine touches as she tries to enter a more male-dominated workplace. We see Edith in a dressing gown in the comfort of her own home, similar to the tea gowns that were popular around this time. It's green with small flowers decorating the front and a black ribbon tying it together. We again see the large sleeves on this outfit. Underneath is a white nightgown or something similar. She only wears it for a few minutes, but honestly it's one of my favorite outfits. Thomas Sharp convinces Edith to go to this party and she wears this simple but very stunning white dress. It is long and elegant and has simple details such as the pearls adorning the dress and draping the front and her shoulders. There is also a black bow on the back of it. Edith also wears a matching cape with the high color for a few moments. The style and silhouette of the dress match many turn-of-the-century evening gowns, 
Although Edith's dress is clearly a bit more modernized, this is one of the few times Edith isn't wearing her signature puff sleeves, but she still stands out against the other women who are wearing darker colors and less modern dresses. There are many paintings from around 1901 that have dresses similar to Edith's. As an example, John Singer Sargent, a painter who it seems was a big inspiration behind many of the dresses in the film, painted this artwork. It is titled Madame Pierre Guitreau or Madame X. Apparently the straps slipping off of her shoulder and the way she was dressed or posed was so scandalous that the model for the painting was publicly humiliated. Quite unfortunate. <laughs> Edith's hair is similar to how she's already been wearing it, although it's a little bit fancier now with swirls and jewels in it. To go on a small tangent, I think Mrs. Mick Michael's dress is very strange. When I first saw it, I was quite confused as I had never seen anything like it. That is, until I found this painting by Sargent with a very similar outfit. Here's another one I found later. I'm not sure if dresses like these were actually worn, but this might be one of the few costumes in the film that I don't really love. Edith wears her golden yellow skirt and her cream blouse in the scene again called the picnic dress. It is paired with a hat covered in flowers and black bows and feathers. Hats like these were common at the time. They often had flowers and feathers, or even full birds occasionally. She also has a very cool belt that's shaped like hands. The belt is based on Victorian mourning jewelry, more specifically um, a pair of earrings that Holly found. Holly said that she wanted the belt to resemble Edith's mother's hands. This is another one of my favorite outfits, as the pink flowers and the golden skirt and the color palette in general looks so pretty. This is also the scene where Edith is most meant to resemble a butterfly, but I'll get into more detail about that later. The next dress that Edith wears is called the Heartbreak Dress. It is a brown yellow color made out of a pleated fabric similar to her blouses with ruffles around the sleeves and neck. Around the ruffles and around her waist are embroidered black designs. She still has large puffy sleeves, but they are considerably smaller. I came across a painting by Gustav Klimt and instantly recognized the dress. I then went on a search to see if Holly had actually used this painting as inspiration, and sure enough she had. This dress has the same sleeves and pleated fabric as the painting, although it's a little bit of a different color and it doesn't have the embroidery. Edith wears this dress with both a shawl and a long black coat in different scenes. This is the dress Edith wears not only when Thomas breaks her heart, but also when her father dies, so obviously where it gets its name from. Edith wears a black mourning outfit to her father's funeral, and even though we only get to see it for a second, Holly apparently put a lot of effort into it. It's a bit sad that we don't get to see more of it, honestly. We can see that it has a high neck black hat with netting, and that's kind of all we can see. Here are a couple real Edwardian mourning dresses for comparison. But regardless, the most important detail of this outfit is the dark red ring that Edith is now wearing. Thomas has proposed to her and she has accepted. When Edith arrives at Allerdale Hall, she is wearing a honeymoon outfit, as I saw someone else call it. She has a long cape cloak over top of one of her yellow dresses. It has flowers and a large ribbon decorating the front. She has a hat with matching colors and flowers. Instead of Edith's usual warm colors, the cloak is gray, purple, and blue. The blue is meant to represent Edith's marriage with Thomas and her entering into this new unknown place. This place contrasts so heavily with Edith's home, draining all the color and warmth out of Edith's life and even her costumes. Even the flowers that decorate her outfits are ominous warnings. They're violets meant to signify mourning. Although that wouldn't concern you, would it, Edith, our very young Jane Austen? <laughs> Though she died a spinster, no? Mother, please. That's all right. Actually, Mrs. McMichael, I would prefer to be Mary Shelley. She died a widow. One of the first things that Edith does after she gets to Allerdale Hall is take a bath, which looks terrifying and is not what I would have done. We can catch a glimpse of her underclothes, as well as a fringe sort of shawl that she wears. The shawl matches her color scheme. Similar shawls or capes were common around the late Victorian era all the way up to the 1920s. We can see that Edith's corset is a golden color, but unfortunately we don't see it very much other than that. However, what we do see seems to be a good mix of historically accurate and fitting the aesthetic of the movie. She wears a long pinkish colored chemise under the corset, which is pleated similar to her blouses. The clothes are meant to convey how vulnerable and out of place Edith is, and I think they do that pretty well. After this, we see what I think is Edith's most iconic outfit, her nightgown. It fits the gothic romance title very well, and it's my favorite outfit. It's so pretty. The high neck pleated fabric and large sleeves that she wears so often are present, but they seem to be amplified. 
The size of the sleeves are the most important in this dress. We can see very well when the sleeves deflate like a hurt butterfly. The smallest that the sleeves ever get are towards the end of the movie when she is injured. Edith's hair is down and wavy, framing her face. She is meant to resemble pre-Raphaelite art, specifically a painting by John Everett Millais called The Bridesmaid. This nightgown creates a ghostly effect, especially when she's running around the mansion's dark hallways, and it looks absolutely haunting. I love it. Edith wears a robe over her nightgown, a green dress with patterned gold leaves, big sleeves, and a long bow. The leaves remind me of the other dressing gown that Edith wears, with the flower and leaf designs. Again, this gown is similar to the tea gowns that many women may have worn around this time. Edith wears a bright yellow dress called the Nancy Drew dress. She wears it while she explores the large, decrepit mansion. Unsurprisingly, it has large 1890 sleeves. There's also a black bow on the back of the dress and beautiful designs of flowers on the sleeves. She also seems to wear this same yellow dress, or maybe a very similar one, with a dark green jacket of sorts. It has yellow and orange details and a very fun high neck. This is what she is wearing when she's informed that Allardell Hall is nicknamed Crimson Peak. That's when you'll find out why they call this Crimson Peak. What did you say? Crimson Peak. That's what they call it. The ore in the red clay leads up from the ground and stay in the snow, turns a bright red. So, Crimson Peak. She wears the Nancy Drew dress again when discovering letters to an unknown woman named Enola, as well as a suitcase with the same name on it. She is also wearing it when she realizes that Lucille is putting something in her tea that's making her sick. The dress is the best example of Edith's likeness to a canary in a coal mine. Danger is beginning to appear and Edith's dress is meant to convey that. She has a dream in which a ghost appears to warn Edith of, it, of the danger she's in. Edith wears her honeymoon outfit again when she leaves Allerdale Hall for a short time. All of the flowers have been removed. It now has an even darker look to it. The flowers on the hat are dead. They're brown. Again, very ominous warning through the costumes, which I think is brilliant. I'm pretty sure she's still wearing the Nancy Drew dress underneath as she attempts to find more about the suspicious Sharp family. We again get a glimpse at Edith's underclothes, this time without the corset. It looks pretty accurate to clothes from this time. She's wearing a very Edwardian styled chemise with her long gold skirt again. For the rest of the movie, we pretty much just see Edith in her nightgown, which I'm not complaining about. I love it so much. In the very last scene, she's wearing a blue cloak over the nightgown. Edith's outfits are absolutely stunning and some of the most effective I've ever seen in conveying the character's personality and feelings and even foreshadowing the plot. I love her costumes so much. Lucille is the older sister of Thomas Sharp. Because the Sharps have lost most of their money, Lucille wears dresses that resemble the 1880s period. Did you see his suit? It was beautifully tailored, but at least a decade old. I can see that you observe far more than I did. And his shoes were handmade but worn. While this may not be the most historically accurate, the decision to have Lucille's dress look older than Edith's dress helped viewers understand the difference between the two women, and I think it's a pretty cool idea. The fashion of the 1880s is very clearly different from the 1890s and early 1900s. Lucille wears tight sleeves and tighter skirts with bustles. It reflects her strict, harsh personality as well as the secret that she is hiding. Many of her clothes are also inspired by gothic architecture, so she fits in with Allerdale Hall, where she has slowly been rotting away. Lucille often wears dark colors like blue and deep red. If Edith is a butterfly, then Lucille is the moth. The first time we see Lucille Sharp, she is playing piano in what I would say is her most iconic dress. The gown is titled the Drop of Blood dress, for obvious reasons. When Lucille emerges from the crowd, her dress gives the impression that blood is spilling from her, pooling on the floor. It's an 1880s inspired gown with an Elizabethan inspired ruff, an eerie lace-up back that resembles a human spine, and the long pleated train that at first glance appears to be a puddle of blood beneath her. There are loops of ribbons along the sleeves, beads hanging off the collar, and dark red jewels in her hair. She is also wearing her red ring that she later has to give up to Edith. The deep red color of the dress stands out among the rest of the party guests. Looking at Edith's modern light dress compared to Lucille's spooky old dress gives a good first impression between the two women. This is my favorite dress of Lucille's we see. It fits the movie very well, as well as Lucille's personality. 
it also is I believe the only dress in the movie that is actually a crimson color sort of meant to warn Edith, again, of Crimson Peak. The next dress that Lucille wears is just as spooky. It's black with a red flower on the front and lace details where you can see the 1880s inspiration in the silhouette and long bustle. There are dark leaves and little tassels around her neck and down the front of her bodice called passementary, I believe. Her collar and cuffs are also trimmed in white lace. She has little black finger fingerless gloves, which are very fun. I would say the, the most interesting part of her outfit is the hat that she wears. Like I said, her clothes are inspired by architecture and her hat is inspired by gargoyles. If you look closely, you'll see a face on the top of her hat. It looks like many hats from this time period, but with a spooky twist. I would say that this is the scene where the differences between Edith and Lucille are the most obvious. Edith's light colored and more modern style is a big contrast with Lucille's dark and old fashioned dress. In this scene, Lucille indirectly compares Edith to a butterfly. Oh, I hadn't seen them. They're dying. They take their heat from the sun, and when it deserts them, they die. That's sad. No, it's not sad, Edith. It's nature. It's a savage world of things dying. Eating each other right beneath our feet. Surely there's more to it than that. Beautiful things are fragile. At home, we have only black moths. Formidable creatures, to be sure, but they lack beauty. They thrive on the dark and the cold. What do they feed on? Butterflies, I'm afraid. She is very clearly telling the audience how she feels about Edith. Near the end of the movie, she even has butterflies in literal cages. Lucille wears this dress once again when Thomas announces that they are leaving Buffalo, this time without the red flower. Also, let's take a moment to appreciate Thomas's glasses. I think they're very fun. Apparently, Lucille was wearing very tall heels the entire movie to make her taller which is very impressive that she managed to run around in very tall heels with these costumes and in general, so good for her. While Edith takes a look around Allerdale Hall, she and Thomas run into Lucille in the kitchen. Lucille is wearing a blue dress in the same shade as her brother's coat. Her and Thomas also seem to match Allerdale Hall, almost like after spending so long there, they became a part of it. The blue dress has a similar sort of silhouette to the drop of blood dress, but obviously less extravagant. It has similar details along the front to the black dress that she previously wore with the leaves and tassels. The appliques also decorate her back and sleeve cuffs. We can also see a little cameo that Lucille wears at her neck. She wears the same outfit the next day when Lucille tells Edith that the red wedding ring that Edith is wearing belonged to their mother. There's a sort of resemblance that we can see in the outfit that Lucille and her mother is wearing with the cameo and the silhouette of the dress. I think that's very interesting. She looks quite horrible. Lucille wears the blue dress for most of the movie, emphasizing the fact that she doesn't have enough money to afford anything else. The next outfit that we see Lucille in is her nightgown. We first see her in this gown when Edith discovers the terrible secret that the Sharps have been hiding, which I will not talk about any further because I hate it and it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Lucille's nightgown is only similar to Edith's in the ghostly white color that they both have, while Edith's nightgown has similar elements of her regular clothes, like sleeves or pleating. This is the first time we see Lucille wearing something so loose and light colored. She is showing her true colors, I suppose. The top of the nightgown has lace details and the sleeves are very large and billowy coming in at her wrists. She takes back her ring in this scene. This is when Alan appears at the mansion and she also puts on an overrobe, which is a greenish blue color and ties it with a red ribbon, sort of to try to hide her secret again. Although obviously it doesn't work. While we don't see Lucille's under things like we do Edith's in the movie, there is actually a deleted sh scene that shows us her corset. I would prefer to ignore this because she's not wearing a chemise under her corset, something you should definitely not do. <laughs> but the corset itself does resemble corsets that women may have worn in the 1870s or 1880s. I also think that her corset resembles this painting I found by Maurice Carbazel, um, and a couple of other paintings that I found. Like I said, a lot of the clothes in this movie take inspiration from real paintings. In conclusion, Kate Hawley's costumes are perfect in complementing the gothic romantic genre that Guillermo del Toro is so insistent the film has. They help with the plot and the characters, and while they're obviously not 100% historically accurate, they do reflect both the movie aesthetic and this time period very well. They match together very well. Also, I'm wearing a very pretty crimson colored skirt, which 
I have to show off because it fits and I wore it for this video and I couldn't just not show it. <laughs> That's all, thank you so much for watching. This is the first video I actually wanted to make because I love the costume so much and I'm very glad that I finally got to do that. So thank you very much for watching. If you have any suggestions, you can leave them in the comments. I will gladly take them. And if you want to subscribe or like, and I will hopefully be back soon with another video. Thank you for watching. Bye!